An obsession with the devil, horror movies, and the occult. That's what motivated David Berkowitz to go on a random killing spree back in 1977 that terrified New York City, it terrified the country. While in prison, the man once known as the son of Sam became a born-again Christian. He spent 100 hours sharing his story with pastor and behavioral scientist Michael Caporelli. Gary Lane brings us more. 44 years ago, fear gripped the Big Apple as a mass murderer gunned down six people and wounded seven others. Describing himself as a monster, David Berkowitz leaves a note at a crime scene, taunting police to stop him. He signs it, Son of Sam. After a massive manhunt, police finally arrest Berkowitz based on an unpaid parking ticket. Berkowitz pleads guilty to the murders and receives 360 years in prison with no chance of parole. In the mid-1990s, Berkowitz professed to becoming a born-again Christian. He reflected on his spiritual transformation during a 1998 prison interview with CBN's Scott Ross. The scars of the past are always going to remain and haunt me, but I've given my life to Jesus Christ, and he has let me know in his word that he's forgiven me completely. Berkowitz explained he'd joined a Satanist cult before his murder spree and heard demonic voices directing him to kill people. Fast forward to 2022, when Pastor Michael Caporelli, a Ph.D. in advanced studies in human behavior, begins a case study on David Berkowitz. He conducts 34 prison interview sessions, a total of 100 hours with a man once known as the Son of Sam. Even as a child, I was fascinated with the occultic things, with the darkness, and it was affecting me. Now I look back and see, of course, it was all deception, and, you know, I, it, I captured my mind, but uh, and I regret that so much for everything that happened. But at that time, I was under that spell. I was under that power of, of evil, and you, you, couldn't, you couldn't bring the, you know, on. I was going down a path of self-destruction. Caporelli's experience and friendship with David Berkowitz is detailed in the new book, Monster Mirror. Well, the author of Monster Mirror, Dr. Michael Caporelli, is with us now. So what, why David Berkowitz? What, what, what fascinated you about him? I think it began for me at 17. I was incarcerated. I gave my life to Christ. And from that day forward, uh, my heart was bent towards those in prisons I knew, uh, I knew what it was like to be behind bars. Uh, I knew how receptive I was in that moment to the gospel. Heard David Berkowitz's testimony in the 700 Club back in the 90s. Oh. And uh, I wrote a, wrote a book a few years ago, a prior book, mailed him a copy called Dr. Jesus about mental health issues from a biblical perspective. Mm -hmm. And because I was both a clergyman that had an understanding of the supernatural as well as a PhD in behavioral science, David thought that it would be a, 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 I'd be a good person to tell the story to be able to elaborate both on the psychological and the diabolical. Well, let's get into the diabolical with David Berkowitz. Uh, um, following his arrest, he several times mentioned that he was obeying demonic voices. Uh, and then uh, through... Uh, I guess, a series of interrogations from the FBI, he, he started recanting that, that it was a, an excuse to say the devil made me do it and that he had to own it. But now coming back again, he's saying, well, yes, indeed, that was true. H how is that linked to what he did? Well, when David showed up uh, in prison back in 1978, Attica, uh, the environment was very contentious. Uh, there was a lot of harassment from inmates about his devil possession story. And I tell this story in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so he recanted the claims that the devil was involved. But today, David knows retrospectively, being a man now who's walked with Christ for 35 years, that Satan was very much involved. When I asked David to describe evil to me, he said, Mike, I got a little TV in my cell. It's about 16 inches. He said, I watched the Animal Channel. He said, and an animal, like a lion, will look at the herd and look for that one injured, vulnerable animal and will prey on that vulner vulnerability. He said, I was that vulnerable kid. Certain vulnerabilities, mental health factors that I describe in the book mm -hmm. that he believes the enemy being predatory in nature, the enemy preyed on those vulnerabilities. And then that then led to mental breaks, which led to 
him killing innocents. This began at six years old. Uh, his story is detailed in the book. At six, he begins with uh, lighting his toys on fire. In fact, by the time he was arrested in 1977, he lit hundreds of fires in New York City. Uh, the NYPD found a journal where all his fires logged. So not only had he gunned down 13 people, but he had lit all these fires, uh, really expressions of his anger, uh, shame, isolation, all the themes that I discuss in the book and discussing how these themes uh, work in synergy with satanic influences. Uh, but the good news is in 1988, the son of Sam uh, became a son of God, and yeah. David's testimony is as bona fide as it gets. Yeah, he's a, he's a real Christian today, and you can hear the difference in his voice and mm. how he looks and how he approaches the world. He's, um, let, let's go back into today, in practically every day, we're seeing the face of evil in the headlines. Yes. And just this past weekend, unspeakable evil where you go into a home and, and you kill children. You, you go into a bomb shelter and you slaughter everyone. You, you take women captive. It, it, it just, how does that come to be? You know, that's really one of the main questions that I'm asking in this book. It really is a book uh, for anyone curious about crime, about violence, uh, anyone who's struggling with mental health problems, uh, because that's a question that David has often uh, contemplated, is what drives senseless violence? I mean, violence that just doesn't make sense. We live in a country where there are 13 mass shootings a week in the United States, school shootings, mall shootings. Uh, so David, you know, his story, believe it or not, the closer I got to David, the more I realized he's not some monster from the abyss. I call it monster mirror because I was expecting to look into a monster. I found myself looking into a mirror and I realized that the line between the psychopath and the population is a lot thinner than we like to believe. Jeremiah says it clearly, the heart of man is wicked and deceitful above all things. So in meeting David, I'm expecting to meet this monster, or at least his past, who he was, and I found themes that are really what I call a recipe for violence, uh, ingredients that are in everybody's cabinet. And I truly believe that anybody is capable of anything, and but for the grace of God, so go I. Yeah, your book absolutely states that, and, and you talk about not Nazi, Nazi guards who were good family men. That's right. Uh, they were you know, at home, peaceful, and then they'd go to work, and they'd commit these horrible atrocities, and then they go back home as if it never happened. We like to think that there are other people. You know, other kids will shoot up schools, not my kids. Other people would commit homicide, not me. There are no other people. Um, and that's really the presupposition of the book. I think the reader is going to look at it and go, wow, I, this guy is pretty relatable. He's not a monster from the abyss. He's the boy next door. Um, so, yeah. Uh, how would you explain, because it seems to be the frequency hmm. seems to be increasing rapidly. Absolutely. I'm a student of history. You look back in history and you unleash an army on a civil, civilian population. Are they going to commit atrocities? The answer is yes, hmm. they are. But now we're seeing it where literally you lose track of the number of school shootings. You lose track of the number of shootings and desecrations of synagogues where it's not safe to go to church anymore. Churches have to hire security guards. Why, why the increase now? Well, you know, I, I describe nine themes in the book uh, that are very relevant to our culture today, and one of them is isolation. Uh, that might sound uh, not accurate to describe America because we're very extrovert, uh, but this is a very isolated nation. We are not collectivists. We are very individualistic, and isolation itself uh, is a breeding ground for violence. I mean, God said it clear in Genesis 2. It's not good for Adam to be alone. Um, studies have been done by University of Japan where they take a group of rodents, isolate a sample of rodents, and after 15 days of isolation, they return the rodents back to their community and they attack the other rodents at the point of reentry. 
because during the isolation, aggression levels go up, empathy levels go down. And we're living in a very isolated society, people hiding behind uh, social media. Uh, I mean, you can have 5,000 friends on Facebook, doesn't mean they're your friends. So this kind of isolation, I believe, is one of the, one of the ingredients that we're, uh, why we're seeing such a, a high rate, a skyrocketing rate of violence in the culture. What would you tell somebody that's noticing their level of aggression, that they're having a, a sort of outbursts of wrath? And, and what, what would you tell them to do? Uh, you know, because sometimes the, the, you're the doctor <laughs> that should be saying, this isn't right. I, I've got to get right. What, what would you tell them to do? I'm glad you asked that question. Probably the most fascinating session I had with David. Mm -hmm. I walked into the session. I describe it in the book. And I could tell he wasn't in good headspace. In fact, he had had uh, a conflict with another inmate that said something very insulting. So David's angry inside the session. And I got an opportunity to watch a man throughout that entire session get angry, but sin not. A man who, listen, it's human to be angry. It's divine to manage that anger. I watched a man navigate through uh, what was really underneath the anger, which was a lot of shame, a lot of fear, um, you know, talk about it. God asked Cain the question, why are you angry? The question is to explore what's underneath this. Cain never answered that question. Well, David did in the session, and uh, we, got, we got into a real heart-to-heart -heart discussion on what was really happening. And by the end of the session, just broke down in tears and said, you know, there was so much shame in, just, in what just happened with that inmate um, in the uh, institution. So my, my counsel to anybody that's dealing with anger is you've got to look underneath it. What's really happening? Because a lot of times anger is a cover-up emotion. It's a secondary response of the brain to masquerade more vulnerable feelings. And until you're willing to deal with the vulnerable feelings, uh, you'll turn to the anger because the anger makes you feel powerful. What would you advise family members, neighbors? I mean, we're hearing the story again and again. Uh, either it, I had no idea that this person was capable of doing this, mm. or, or we're hearing... Uh, he was always a loner or, mm. you know, there were, there were other signs. What, what would you tell family members, friends, neighbors? What, what should they look out for? You know, David's of, often asked that question, looking back at his own childhood. Could something have been done to prevent uh, what happened? David was a New York City boy. He was surrounded by people. Not this depiction of a loner, you know, like the Unabomber in the woods with a shaggy beard. He's a New York City boy. He's a part of baseball teams. He's a part of the Appalachian Mountain Club. Big difference between being with people and bonding with people. David was surrounded by people, but yet still felt alone. Um, and I know that there are readers that are going to read this book and go, I know what it feels like to be in a crowd of people and feel still by myself. Uh, probably as caretakers, as teachers, as ministers, um, if we could take an empathetic approach, um, empathy always paves the way. To relationship, um, and hopefully through that empathetic approach, uh, inspire someone to maybe open up and talk about what's really happening in their head. Yeah, get involved in community is is a Absolutely. wonderful thing. Yeah, and let your church be a, a prime community. Well, Dr. Michael's book is called Monster Mirror, and uh, it's certainly a timely book for today. To how, to, how for how you can get a copy, go to cbnnews.com. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Yeah. And if also, you can go to horizonshine.org, David's website. Okay.